I think we should start. Yeah, indeed. So basically, my um, first question would be, uh, why do you think the first question? Why do you think the SEC started to bother on the like right now and not a year and a half ago? So they actually the SEC did interact with Telegram previously. They didn't just start the lawsuit. Um, the Telegram white paper was issued on January 18th, 2018. And I think they actually started the development. Well, just to give, you know, I know you have mostly a Russian speaking audience here, but just to give some quick background, um, the two main people associated with Telegram are Pavel Durov and his brother, um, who's a very talented programmer, but sort of less the public face. Pavel started to be contacted in Russia in 2006, which Americans describe as the Russian version of Facebook. And because of a conflict with Putin's government they end, and relate to privacy issues, uh, user privacy, privacy issues, they, they left Russia and started up on other projects. Now they, they both did very well, the Duro brothers, they both did very well from that initial to contact project and some other related projects. In 2013, they founded Telegram, um, and its key uh, offering was Telegram, or is Telegram Messenger. Now, Telegram's a private company, which is very interesting. Pavel Durov is the CEO of that company, and it's entirely free. And you, you, Pavel has a very interesting reputation of being very privacy-oriented, or at least saying he is. Um, Telegram's clearly very popular within the crypto community. It's even though it got big and popular and has 300 million users, it doesn't or didn't as of yet have a revenue model. Uh, so in 2017, uh, Pablo's brother came up with this idea for the um, Telegram blockchain or Ton blockchain. And that would be powered or would have on it usable its native cryptocurrency, which would be the Gram. So Ton stands for Telegram Open Network. So they conceptualized this, they started to build it out. And then in 20, January 18th, 2018, they issued their white paper. And that white paper had some items in it that were, it was later used against them by the SEC and the courts. And it really shows that it's, you have to be careful with your communications. You have to be careful with what you write down and what you tell people. And then in early 2018, which is really January through March, and this is the key, uh, litigation between the SEC and Telegram, they did two separate capital raises, two separate private capital raises, where they received $1.7 billion total, or euro, you know, $1.7 dollars worth of dollars in euro, from, entirely from private investors. Really interesting. Um, they did not do a public offering. They didn't offer it just to anyone. Um, it was very high net worth, very sophisticated entities. And when they did this, I'll go into a little bit more detail. The SEC reached out to them and said, hey, have you, what's your, under what securities law are you doing this? Because we believe that whatever you're offering to these investors is a security right now. So then Telegram um, filed what's called a Form D, which is a way of taking advantage of an exemption to the registration requirement, and we'll talk about that. And so from, SEC has been aware of Telegram for a while. It didn't just kick in. Um, the first reach out from the SEC was saying, hey, guys, you need to file Form D. Then in, let's see here, exactly. I think in 20, 2019, before, right before the blockchain was going to launch and the tokens were going to be issued, the SEC filed what, sort of an emergency lawsuit against Telegram to stop the issuance of their tokens. So it's been going on for a while. And then just now, or fairly recently, they moved from a restraining order or a cease and desist to a formal preliminary injunction. So we can go in more detail, Bob. I, I wanted to give a little bit of background. You know, they, it's, it's not a sudden process. SEC and Telegram have been dancing around for a long time now. Yeah, but what I meant is, it's kind of everything was publicly fine. And then when they, started to talk about distribution and immediately SEC was jumped in and said no. So 
does it mean that it was like planned because it, it could be known up front or like who was not communicating it properly right the, um, it's a good question i mean you know that's like why, why did the sec hold its fire in the beginning it's kind of it's kind of the question the um, It's hard to say. I, I think the SEC was wrestling with what is a security, and there's good arguments that Graham's not a security, and there's good arguments that the initial sale to these wealthy parties, uh, while that, that may have involved a sale of security, that what would happen later would not be a security. So I think the SEC was kind of wrestling with that, and first was trying to wrap their head around it, and second of all, didn't want to appear as too aggressive. I think the SEC was, was also looking at the EOS model and the EOS model and the Telegram capital raising models are different. And I think there's a reason why EOS kind of got away with a $23 million slap on the wrist and Telegram didn't. And it's mostly related to the structuring of the sale of their tokens. The, um, I, think, I think what happened, what finally made the SEC move quickly, like I mentioned, is that Telegram was just about to deliver the underlying tokens to the early investors. And those early investors might have turned around and immediately resold those tokens to the public. So that's what kind of created the emergency. Okay, and what could you outline the difference between EOS sale, structure of EOS sale and Telegram sale? Because I was also surprised when they just paid a fine and that's it. Yeah, so let me, I'll, 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 I'll say what Telegram did, and then I'll kind of describe how EOS got a little bit more careful or distant from that. So what Telegram did is in early 2018, when they, when they raised this money, they didn't technically sell the grams to these early investors. They, they sold something called a gram purchase agreement. And they did this in two separate rounds. There's, some, there's the round one investors and the round two investors. So the round one investors uh, bought these grand purchase agreements and these agreements said, it was really interesting. They said, you will only get your gram once the ton blockchain is up and working. In other words, these, once these crypto are usable on the ton blockchain. In other words, the, the, the theory was that at that point they'd be a utility or a commodity. And also the earliest investors, the round one investors, had holding periods assigned to the gram. So after the blockchain launched, there was a three month period, a six month period, a 12 month period and an 18th month period, the four periods. And those round one investors could only liquidate 25% of the gram at a time. So not only could they not sell any gram until the token was functional, but they, it was structured so that they couldn't dump it on the market. The round two investors who bought just a month or two later after the round one investors paid, I think three times what the round one investors paid, but they had no lockup period. So that's like kind of a little scary. It makes it look very much like a security. Looks like someone's just trying to buy it and sell it at a quick profit, unlike the first ones. And what the court got into in this preliminary injunction, we can go into this, is the ongoing success of the ton blockchain seemed to be highly related to the ongoing involvement of both Telegram, the company, and the Durov brothers. In other words, if Telegram and the Durov brothers sort of disappeared, the ton blockchain might kind of limp along, but nothing would really happen. So there's a stronger argument there that this was called a common enterprise under Howie. Now let's compare that with EOS. EOS is kind of an interesting, different situation. They, EOS is basically a software publisher. They did not take personal responsibility. Of course, they developed the software that's associated with their network, but it's open source. Anyone can fork it. And even the original EOS network, the main net, the one we all talk about when we say EOS, that was not technically initiated by block one. It took, I don't have the exact mechanics down, but basically a certain number of validators or participants or, net or network individuals had to sort of vote to launch that network. 
So Dan Larimer's dad um, actually created a structure, and I found a post of this from like four years before US launched, about how you can avoid being nailed as a common enterprise by if you're by becoming a software publisher and then having someone else launch the network for you. Now, obviously, obviously, EOS has had mixed results in that, sort of being hands-on and hands-off, but Telegram is much more involved with the development of the blockchain software and the actual launch of the platform. So the SEC had more material to attack with. I, I see you scratching your head, so what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I was muted. So I was thinking that basically the EOS network was launched by for them by somebody else yes but they they sold and distributed the tokens yes now it's also interesting that eos um kind of sold placeholders if i understand it correctly eos sold placeholders for the tokens i think on ethereum and then when the mainnet launched those kind of jumped over and the original investors got their eos tokens the but Right, the main point is that EOS itself did not actually launch the platform. Okay, and there's lots of forks of EOS and lots of people are doing it. So you can't really say block one is, I think there's like the quantum EOS blockchain. You know, block one is definitely not launching that one. So they, they made a really strong and clear divide between being a software publisher and running an enterprise. And they also segregated the, the venture arm, the one that's sort of promoting the adoption of EOS and the you know, rise of different companies, the ongoing development of the software, the validators, the, it's kind of such a governance mess that, that in a better position from the securities law perspective. For better or for worse, Telegram is not a governance mess. It is clear that at least the moment, Telegram developed the software, is launching the software, is gonna improve it post-launch, and it's gonna maintain effective control over governance until some point. So th that's kind of where they cross lines. So basically it's about the structure, about who did what at what moment of time and how it looked like from the like common enterprise perspective. Right, so there's, it's, it, so, in both cases, whether you're looking at EOS or Telegram or any other one of these sort of startups, and I'm getting one check here. Actually, uh, forget, do me a favor, all, all, all comments, drop it in the chat just so I can see it because that's my big window. Um, so this, we're gonna get into our famous utility token debate. The, the, the premise behind both EOS and Telegram is that while the network is being built and perhaps launched, the tokens that are associated with that network might be securities because they're not usable, they're not functional, they're not commodities. At best, there may be a speculation that they're gonna become usable later. And under US law, if there's a thing that's potentially not a security token, but it's not yet functional, it's what I call pre-functional utility token. There's a general consensus that that's a security because you're, you're kind of venturing that it may become useful later, but it's not useful now. And you're probably buying it because you want to sell it for profit, not because you want to consume it. The developing point of view, though it's not the majority point of view, is that after a blockchain network launches and tokens are usable on that network to get goods or services or make use of the different aspects of the network so long as it doesn't have security like characteristics it's quite possible that those tokens won't be securities um so i mean basically they can be like software licenses and here's the example i always give you can imagine the g suite or google apps suite if google turned around and said you know rather than just paying us with your credit card to use google docs you're going to just use our google tokens and that's all um, it would be very hard to argue that those tokens are securities because all they're really doing is just giving you access to, to software licenses. When you have a gray zone, though, and you can't quite tell whether something's a security or not a security, this is the famous Howey test. Um, the idea is that the term security is defined in the U.S. securities law, specifically in the 1933 Act, 
And section 2A1 of that act defines securities, like the very first section. And one category of security is an investment contract, which is undefined in the act. And as we've discussed, what makes an investment contract? Well, it wasn't defined in the, in the law, but it's a very famous case, SEC versus Howey developed the text. And so that's where you get, was there an investment of money in a common enterprise where the efforts were primarily the result of someone else's work or all the work, depending on how you read Howey. Um, I think I did out of order. An investment of money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits where most or all the work is being done by other people. So in the case of EOS, the, it's not clear if there's a common enterprise. Because if you have a software publisher here, but the people launching the network are over there. And the people launching governing the network are not one company, but a group of companies, all these validators, all these proof of stake guys, and they're fighting with each other. There's an argument there's no common enterprise. So the SEC had a really hard case with EOS. With Telegram, though, it's a much stronger argument that at least in the beginning, using how we test, it's a security. Because you clearly have an investment of money. I mean, people bought these tokens with dollars and euros. They bought them from um, a company that was owned by Telegram called Ton Issuer. They, it's, for better or for worse, clearly a common enterprise. You have Telegram, one company, that's responsible for taking the money and building up the network and the fate of the investors is tied in with the fate of the issuer. And the investor's money is being pooled, which is another meaning of the term common enterprise. Um, even though Telegram later on disclaimed the idea that people would be purchasing or investing for profit and that they would go up in value, unfortunately, their early marketing and early materials very much oriented on the idea that, the, that these gram tokens would go up in value over time. And you know, there's also some theory out there or some idea that they tried to float that the network would be self-sufficient and the Dura brothers wouldn't be involved and Telegram wouldn't be involved and it would just kind of grow because the community would support it. Well, that's a nice theory, but that's clearly false. It's the Dura brothers, Telegram and Telegram's resources that made the Telegram blockchain attractive. So it's a really hard argument to say that anytime soon, it'd be through the efforts of others. So. Paul, to get to, to, to get to your point, if you're applying the Howey test to both, which you should, it was had a much stronger argument because it was so fractured than Telegram did. Okay, so basically, yeah. can I point out some new ones? In, one, one question. So imagine, just imagine that EOS was sponsoring two entity that were launching the EOS network and mm. passing the right to sell all EOS tokens to block one. Would it be considered common enterprise or no? Like they just, whatever, created 20 random companies with their friends. So not there's a, not, the, not, the course I'm going to look at. Oh, one second, ahead. Gordon. Imagine that 20 people want to create an enterprise, right? So, and they get stakes in the company, right? So this is called enter common enterprise. Then imagine that 20 people are just negotiating with each other and saying, oh, let's launch 20 enterprises and do this consortium. And it's no longer a common enterprise. Will it help? <laughs> yeah, no, it will. Okay, so it, it, it could potentially help. So when you, so the court, the SEC and the courts don't, care about the form of transactions and they don't care about labels. They care, they care about, they don't, they don't put form ahead of substance. They look at the economic reality of what's going on. Okay. They, they kind of look, they kind of look, I mean, they really say, you know, what are the facts and circumstances? What's actually going on here? Forget the label. Now, if, you, if I am trying to get around the common enterprise concept by setting up 20 companies, you know, some in China, some in Chile, some in the US, some in Europe, you know, with my friends or people that kind of, you know, I would deal with, wink, wink, nod, nod. It's maybe harder for the SEC and anyone else to prove, but if these entities are acting in a coordinated manner, either because they have formal contracts or it's just understood, there's a good argument that 
legal forms don't matter. That's really just a common enterprise. I agree. Now, what's um, interesting with EOS is these validators, there's two ways of looking at EOS validators. Either the majority owned or majority dominated by a few large Chinese entities, in which case there really may be a common enterprise there. You know, maybe it's not block one, maybe it's these kind of this consortium of, of validators, of proof of stakeholders. Um, another way of looking at it is these guys can't get along and can't decide on anything. Well, to EOS's credit, and this is where US securities law is a little bit messed up, to EOS's credit, the fact that they can't get along and can't do anything together actually makes them less of a security because there's no common enterprise there, but there's a bunch of competing market actors. I'll, I'll, I'll analogize to Bitcoin. The, the, the fact that Bitcoin is so hard to upgrade and improve helps Bitcoin not be a security because if there's one governing body or everyone got along and decided consistently to approve every upgrade and make and act in coordination, um, especially if there's a few large entities doing that. Okay, it's like a common enterprise. Gordon, what, what has actually has happened is that these independent operators they gave the permission to one company which is block one yep. to sell and distribute all the eos tokens how come if they are so no, no, no. actually block one didn't sell a single token okay they, they, block one didn't, did not did not sorry let me say that better block okay. one did not launch that network mm -hmm. and the distribution of the eos tokens was not a result of block one's activity block one published the software for eos okay and so who sold the token that. Not quite that clean, but it's much further away from being an issuer than Telegram would be. Okay, and who sold the US tokens then? That's an interesting question. I, I, th I think the best way to say it, and probably the audience would know how to explain this better than I would even, is they were the placeholders, if you like, were sold by block one, but then other parties launched the mainnet, and there were sort of reserved positions on that mainnet for these early investors, but it wasn't actually block one that issued them. And knowing your audience, they could explain in better technical terms than I could, but it, the main idea is that EOS itself did not cause the creation of tokens on the blockchain that from which they were issued. But who got the money? Uh, you know what, I, I actually got to Tim is on this and he's on the chat and he is someone who would know. Actually, you know what? Uh, can you, can, let's, Tim, unmute yourself or Pavel, unmute Tim, our blockchain uh, incredible part of that. Sure, just unmuted. Can um, you get some video with you or not? Sure, we got some video going. Yeah. Hey, hey, how's everybody doing? I Good. see Gordon, I see Pavel. Um, yeah, interesting situation. They definitely did, uh, you know, they, the way that they titled it, the way that they framed it is that they were, as you said, just providing the software. Uh, then they, there really was no incentive behind different uh, quote unquote investors, but a lot of people who did, uh, you know, non-American globally uh, own tokens. It wasn't a, a state staking network, uh, but in their, in their DPoS system, a lot of the people that actually uh, were part of the test nets and, and early on trying to create, uh, trying to launch the network. Uh, it was launched completely externally. Um, so what, what we had been doing was for months we had been, uh, we launched several test nets. Uh, and then when it came down to actually uh, launching the main net, there were actually two different factions of groups that were kind of guarding around. We, we, most mm -hmm. people knew that it would be an important thing to, to be a part of the launch and there were a bunch of different theories about how the main net would be launched. There was a lot of theory about whether or not it would be a splintered launch, whether multiple main nets would be launched first and then one would survive. Um, we ended up after days of kind of arguing and bickering on certain styles of how we were going to launch this and, and the technique of we were going to launch it, that we all kind of came together. Um, it was uh, kind of a combined effort of uh, myself, some guys in, in Canada, uh, John Milborn in, in, um, in, in, in Asia, uh, and then, then you know, the, the collective group early on um, really was just ragtag group of really decentralized people wanting just to run some software. Most of us had run different builds. Um, the actual certified first build really wasn't, wasn't published. It was updated literally day of launch. We were expecting to have it earlier than that. Um, but we had been running 
pretty solid test builds on test nets prior to that. Uh, so you know, one of the one of their claims for the SEC uh, was the fact that this was not launched by them. The actual tokens weren't. We all fired. Um, there was a specific time to shut the Ethereum contract down. If people do remember, uh, they sold the tokens on the Ethereum network, um, and there was a specific. Um, uh, uh, command that was used to close the the, the contract on the Ethereum side. Okay. Um, I'm interrupt. Is there, you're, you're saying better than I did, and, and that locked those positions into place. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then when the main net got launched, it kind of reflected those positions, but it wasn't actually launched by Block One. Correct. Yeah, and you you actually had to. Uh, there was a conversion from Ethereum that you had to do for your. Uh, you, you, your, your wallets. We took an image or we took a uh, you know, basically time stamped uh, ownership from uh, Ethereum wallets uh, on uh, I think it was the 31st of May. Uh, the expected launch was supposed to be June 2nd. There was a time stamp of Ethereum accounts on the 31st of May that we imported. Um, we imported, the external community imported uh, mm -hmm. into the mainnet. Uh, but we all verified that was a thing that we all wanted to make sure was accurate um, because we wanted it to to go by with what they were saying that they were doing. So, you know, the external community is the one that... Let me pause you. So these other EOS forks, are they honoring, for lack of a better word, these locked-in Ethereum positions? Not, you know, it's all over the board. I mean, to be honest with you, like, I, you know, I, I'm very critical against... Um, parts of DPoS now myself, you know, I thought, thought it was an interesting exper experiment. Um, what Block One has done is kind of within the SEC has solidified themselves as a software provider. Um, I, I believe that uh, there are, there are initially, the, you know, if, if we had had entered blockchain communication, that would have mattered. Now you're just having all of these splintered networks that it's no holds barred, right? So anyone is kind of taking their own theory uh, and these different kind of governance uh, groups are coming together to make one small change to a network, call it a new thing and, and relaunch. They don't have to pay any attention to any of the uh, balances that had come from the initial sale at all. Um, so, so, what's interesting there, so what, this is what I was getting at. So block one, and again, Dan Larimer's dad published something on this that I scraped up <laughs> and he published it two years before US launched he said, this is how you launch this sort of platform without being nailed as an issuer or as a common enterprise. I mean, it's out there on the internet. You just have to dig deep. And you know, it's, it's interesting. I first, I thought, interesting, I thought the lawyers were very creative, but then when I read his dad's paper, I'm like, oh, I, I see where this all came from. So Pablo, to the point we're kind of discussing, EOS was smart. EOS was effective. I'm gonna be careful with my language. In separating the software development role from the, main net or side net launch role. Now that's tough because as Tim's getting at and is true on Bitcoin and a lot of these things, what, you know, sure you can do that and spare yourself legal consequences of being a securities issuer probably, but then your network is sort of out of control. I mean, once you launch it, how do you improve it going forward? Or is it just is what it's gonna be for the rest of time? I mean, maybe, yeah, that's Bitcoin. maybe Bitcoin doesn't need to improve, but these other networks that are trying to provide greater functionality, I think they have to improve over time because blockchain technology is improving and if they don't improve them, later products are going to be better. They don't have the first mover advantage that Bitcoin has. Uh, yeah, have my, my question was actually, okay, imagine that we, nobody is legally launched the network and played the issue role, but somebody got the money, this for whatever, four billion dollars or how much? So it was one company, one person, or how was this structured then? You're talking about EOS or Block One? Yeah, EOS money, yeah. But I, I, I'm not privy to the internal aspects of it, but I think, I believe it's all paid to EOS. Yeah, Block One had a, a Cayman entity. I said, yeah, Block One, I'm yeah. sorry. The block One had a Cayman entity to, to roll it out. And, and they, they, they did get fined by the SEC. Um, they, they, they did take a, a fine from the SEC, but they worked with the SEC hand in hand on what they were explaining to them as, as trying to stay away from U.S. Uh, uh, US involvement is what, they, is what they were trying to claim to do. 
I, I think I think 23 million on the amount they raised was a safe base saving fine by the SEC. And I think the SEC would have had an extremely difficult time holding Block One as an entity accountable if someone else launched the networking issue tokens. You could theoretically get there, but just just you, you know, the, the expression I always use is this world is not clear. So you want to be the cleanest dirty shirt on the dirty shirt line, right? So you know, you can't issue these tokens perfectly, but Block One structured very well to sort of create a Chinese wall between them as software publisher and all of this kind of craziness of people watching and trying to govern the network. T Telegram, we, we should talk about the economic policy impact of this in a second. Telegram didn't do that. Took in money through Ton issuer, Ton issuer, an entity. Used that money to support Telegram directly, the actual parent company, and to build out the blockchain. And was stewarding this process forward until the SEC got in their face. And just from a policy or an incentives point of view, I think we all want these projects to launch and be successful and to be improved over time post launch. So there's a kind of a perverse incentive in place now where we're forcing these founders to back off and not bring in their skill and guidance out of fear of being found to be a common enterprise. So this is what I was alluding to before. I, I think we actually need to rework the law so that people can crowdfund products in this way and not be forced to sort of back off or play all these games. Now, let me, let me kind of play with Telegram for a moment here. The, the theory is that once the Tom blockchain launched, that the Gram tokens or Gram crypto would not be securities anymore because they would be functional, they'd be consumable. What the court decided in this preliminary injunction, which I think is crazy, is they said that these Gram purchase agreements, yes, we all agree those are securities, just like a SAP is a security. But they claimed that when the Gram tokens got delivered to the original investors post launch, it doesn't matter that they are functional. It doesn't matter that the blockchain happened because the court is going to decide to look back to 2018 when evaluating the grant. Of course, you know, there's a, and there's a fair amount of law saying, you know, you look at the sale or offer sale when it happened to try to evaluate the characteristics of what you're selling. You know, that's good for the 1980s when things don't evolve over time. But the SEC itself, itself uh, Commissioner Himmon, when he spoke at Yahoo last year, talked and he was talking about ethereum he talked about how when a token is being when a blockchain is being built and pre-launched it may be a security like ethereum may have been a security but when you get quote unquote sufficiently decentralized the nature of the thing may change and we have to allow for the fact that something may have started as a security and is then no longer a security well if you look at telegram if they launched a blockchain and the thing was working and consumable Suppose the grams weren't coming from these early investors. Suppose they were just selling grams to the general public. Well, that's like my Google Apps license. I mean, it's not a security anymore. So, I mean, are you telling me that if they sold grams to the general public, those aren't securities, but somehow these early investors have securities? It doesn't make any sense. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, so basically, if they would structure the sale in a few chunks, and the first chunk would be clearly a security. Then using that money, they will create a network mm -hmm. and then have issue tokens to the early yeah, securities to early um, investors, then crowd invest the next whatever 20%. And this next 20% would might not be a security anymore. Could not be. So it, 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 let's, let's assume something for this conversation. Let's assume that after you launch a blockchain and the network's functional, if you make use of tokens to benefit from the functionality of that blockchain and you don't add in stuff like dividends or profit sharing or any of that, it's just like really good software license. Let's assume for this conversation that that's not a security. Mm -hmm. Just like a Google Apps license isn't a security. And that seems to be true. Not everything on the planet is a security and not every token is a security. The question is, before that blockchain is functional, what are those things? So specifically, those early Telegram investors, 
they signed this RAM purchase agreement. It's a piece of paper or digital object. And there's no argument that that wasn't a security. It was. But it was a security that promised the delivery of something later. And there's no reason or the court assumed but did not prove that that thing which would be delivered later must also be a security because the thing that it's originating from was a security. Well, that's obviously silly. I mean, if I, if I invest in a gold mine and I get paid dividends in gold, sure, my original investment was a security, but gold didn't magically turn into a security just because it came from my original investment. And what's the court trying to say? That it's a security for me, but everyone else on the planet who's using gold, it's a commodity, it doesn't make any sense. So th there's a flaw in the court's reasoning, right at the heart of their reasoning, which is anything that comes or arises over time from that original security sale must downstream be a security also. Well, in the world of tokens, that's clearly not true. I mean, these things can just be functional. And so I, I think Telegram's lawyers sh should have made a better argument. You know, I, I read through all the papers. They should have made a better argument, saying they may very well be securities in the hands of Telegram. They may be securities in the hands of initial investors. But this thing you're worried about, about these tokens reaching the general public, doesn't matter because the moment it goes in those general public hands, it's not a security anymore. The only thing they can do with it is use it on the Telegram network. I mean, they also can expect profit, but that's probably another. Yeah. Um, well, the, right. We've talked about this before. The the expectation. So the actual how we uh, case when it's laying out the four prongs when it comes to actual when it comes to expectation on profit. The actual language is led to an expectation of profit. In other words, I'm selling you something, probably an investment, and I'm either stating or I'm implying that if you put money into this, it's going to go up and value. You. you don't have to do anything, you know, efforts of others, and you can sell in the market for more money. Okay, so that, that's part of how we, that expectation of profit thing. But the idea is that I'm the one working to make that thing go up and value, you, and it's going up in value because my company or my enterprise is producing profits or being economically successful. The, when I buy a house that I'm going to live in, but I also know it's in a good neighborhood and can go up in value over time. Sure, I have a profit expectation. I may even have a profit motivation, and that, that might be about why I'm buying that house. But that house is not a security. So pr profit by itself is not a security. Gold goes up, gold goes down. Yeah, this is interesting because, yeah, if you're living in a neighborhood and this neighborhood is constantly adding new features and developing, so basically you are expecting a profit yeah. because the neighborhood goes better. So, right, that, that's a beautiful example. So, uh, and right, you imagine, imagine that neighborhood. Yeah. Second? And you may be paying for this for the improvements like each month. Right, you're, you're paying. See, value is a tricky word. You're, the house is not more valuable or necessarily because it's making you a profit or because it's an enterprise. It's more valuable because it's more useful. It's better, it's better uh, Someone needs to mute themselves. So tokens can go up in value because their utility goes up in value. Just like you know, between Microsoft Office 2010 and Microsoft Office 365 right now, the newer version is clearly more valuable because they added more features and made it better. That doesn't mean that I profited by these improvements over time in the security sense. But the one version today is clearly more valuable than the version before. So we, we've, it's, it's the mere idea that a token goes up because the network gets better is not a reason to believe it's a security. And, and again, let, let's think about the policy aspect. Do we really want to build in a disincentive to improving a network and making it more usable over time because people are afraid of it becoming a security? If you want a successful society, a society all of the incentives should be aligned towards making things better. I mean, I think with all this COVID stuff, we're seeing what happens when incentives aren't aligned towards making things better. Okay, and everyone's kind of scrambling and beggaring their neighbor. Right? So there's the way the law is, 
there's the fact that I think the court made a mistake, and there's also the way the law should be, which is there should be an economic incentive for, for the founders to stay involved and put in their efforts. There should be an economic incentive to not put, have your network be static out of fear of being found of security, but to always be improving it over time and to make the tokens more valuable over time. That will drive innovation. Uh, Gordon, so I have a, like a question, like, don't you think that this security law should be updated? Because like, yes. if we have the, I mean, all, there could be for many uh, views. So if like with EOS, just if separate entities launched the network, but only one got all the money, isn't it a sign of the direct like common enterprise or no? It, it sure smells like it, but the fact that it smells like it is really interesting, but not sufficient because the, the clever thing they did by just publishing software and having someone else bring up the network, you can't really logically get around the idea or the fact that block one did not launch the US network and that the people who got their tokens the U.S. tokens did not get them from block one. And it's you know, clear and settled law that if I'm merely making an instrumentality that someone else uses, you know, I am not, I see Justin who's on this, you know, can kind of explain this in the ISP or, or sorry, in the money transmitter context. The, just me as a software publisher for a blockchain platform, I'm not the platform. I'm just creating sort of like a schematic for it. It's like the architect who doesn't build the house. It's like, here, here's the plans, go do, go do what you want with them. It's almost exactly like that. So yes, there's, you know, there's a little bit of wink, wink, nod, nod, whatever going on with all this, but you, the SEC, no doubt was unaware of the huge problem they'd have proving that EOS was actually the issuer of these things. Okay, and actually the, the core law in the US, it's section five of the 33 act. It makes it unlawful to offer for sale, sale, or deliver securities that have been sold without an effective registration statement. That's the core rule of the 33 Act. Okay. But it wasn't EOS doing any of those things. They didn't, they didn't offer for sale. They didn't sell and they didn't deliver. Or at least they didn't deliver. Okay, let me kind of catch myself there. They didn't deliver the tokens. And it looks like your sale or offer to sale was either outside the United States or to accredited investors. So what this is going to say you know you get you gave someone else you're the architect you gave away the plan for the house and now we're going to hold you responsible for the house i see tim's deep in thought i mean okay. it's, 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 actually let, let me throw something out there J justin if you're actively watching right now um uh, take yourself off mute turn on your video and then let's have a discussion about the money hey justin so you and i had an interesting conversation where the software developer behind a money transmittal system, if they're not actually transmitting the money themselves, and they're not yelling and screaming about how this is how you evade money laundering laws, if it's if the software they develop is misused, they're not directly responsible for it. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm not a lawyer. I'm a technology guy. So hey, I, I'm not I'm, anyone's lawyer here. We're just talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. But so like I may be the wrong person to ask for legal advice versus technology architecture advice. But you know what what my experience has been with other clients that we've worked with working around some of the compliance stuff. Um, mm -hmm. What you're saying might be extrapolated from what I said, which was actually the inverse of that which is like, you know, if you are operating the software and you are advertising it as a way to circumvent the laws, or if you release the software and you're advertising it as a way to circumvent the laws, then you may have more responsibility than if you release the software and people happen to figure out a way to circumvent the laws with it. And I think this specifically came down to a use case where someone had a, a mixer and they were advertising the mixer as, hey, you can use this as a way to clean your funds. And, you know, the fact that they were use, advertising it as a way to clean the funds was something where uh, the Justice Department used that as an excuse to go after them, right? Yeah. Because now you're not just someone who offered like a decentralized application, you know, that's just sitting out there and running on the network. 
you're actually like building marketing materials that are telling people to utilize it in this specific way that's in violation of the law, and then you're profiting off of the results of that. And whether you're using decentralized software or other things, if you're making a profit by you telling people to break the law, you're probably going to find yourself in trouble. But yeah, I, but I, I would agree that, you know, there are use cases for sure where people could, you know, release software and that software could have many uses. And if one of those uses happened to be in breaking the law and that that was not a use case that was advertised, designed, or the primary use case that, you know, that that software was for, and by the way, like this isn't like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's not for that. Like, you know, the 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 the, the lawyers and the prosecutors are are smart enough to figure out if you're using the word "clean your money" versus "launder your money." That doesn't that doesn't get the job done. Uh, so, uh, but you know, if someone happens to use your software to do something illegal, right? That happens all the time. People use iPhones to break the law. That doesn't make Apple liable for it. Right. If Apple said our new encryption scheme helps you hide your drug proceeds from the cops and people use iPhones to hide their drug proceeds from the cops, then they might find themselves in a different situation. I think it's yeah, beautiful. The, there's another analogy I sort of use, which is, you know, there's quote unquote password recovery software. Oh, did you forget your password here? Use our nice little software to help you. So you can don't so you don't, you're no longer locked out of your iPhone or computer. Well, obviously that can be used to break into someone else's computer. But if you're marketing it as password recovery software, like legitimate, and it does have that use, you know, exactly to Justin's point, the fact that some people misuse it doesn't kill it. And I think in the case of the mixer, they were both marketing it a certain way. And I think they were actually in some cases operating the mixing software. Justin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember the details, to be honest. This was a, a while ago. There have been a lot of weird legal things in the meantime. Yeah, well, there, it, it's an interesting area. So let's kind of bring that analogy over to EOS. If, if they're merely publishing software that can be used legitimately and can be used illegitimately, but they're not yelling and screaming about illegitimate use, and there really is a, a legitimate use there, and they're not issuing the tokens, and they're not operating the platform, it really can't be held liable. So that, that was their structure. Telegram got, was brave. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. They were more aggressive than EOS was. And they published the software. They launched the platform. They were going to issue the tokens. But they were kind of eating their own dog food. So there was, they couldn't, even though they tried later, they couldn't sort of disclaim responsibility for the network. Or what was going on? It's clear that they were the issuer, and there was a common network or common enterprise. There's one, there's one aspect we haven't talked about, which is interesting. This is the first time I've seen this. In this preliminary injunction, the SEC made an argument, and the court went along with it. They said that all of those early purchasers of the grand purchase agreements weren't legitimate investors holding for their own purposes. Each one of them was instead an underwriter under the Securities Act. In other words, they, each one of them, would, if they were gonna turn around and sell their tokens, hold on, Tim, I see. If they were gonna turn around and sell their tokens to the general public, they would have to register them under Section 5 or find a valid exemption. Okay, now, I can argue, I can strongly argue against this, and I think I will, but Tim, make your comment. Just to let, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, also having been on the legitimate side of an, of an OTC desk uh, mm -hmm. and the way that those were coming through, um, the top-down uh, discussions in, in, in how to profit off the early rounds of grams uh, mm -hmm. were that basically people receive these in different areas of the world and the expectation was is that a lot of them would be the reseller at the next round, right? So some of the early blocks, the early, the right, earliest the next blocks, private round or the next public, the next private round, right? So this this is similar to underwriting, right? And so they would take the initial block was a hundred million dollars. No one was talking to them unless they had a hundred million dollars to to offer up for a block of grants. Mm -hmm. Then they would be eligible into selling into round two or round three, etc. 
Um, so they were, they were offering these to be split at certain times. And what the, I don't know if that was ever contractually negotiated, obligated, but the word from the circles was that was the expectation. So it's likely that in the prosecutor's findings that he was probably tipped off to that fact. And I have a securities background myself that smells of underwriter in every other sense of what it, uh, of the operation of an underwriter. Uh, so that was quite, you know, a little bit different than I had heard any, any, any other uh, token sale uh, in the objective of any other token sale. Let me, let me, that's fascinating. Let me respond to what you're saying because you, you just added a whole nother layer to this. So the actual complaint by the SEC and the judge's ruling on this preliminary injunction didn't mention what you mentioned. They were saying just that these large early investors weren't really, were going to eventually sell the, to the public, not other ones. And this, uh, grams ha wouldn't really come to rest in their hands. They would only come to rest once they hit the general public. Therefore, they're underwriters. That's what they said. And that's why they interceded to stop even the distribution of grams to these people, not to the general public, but to these people. They did not bring up what you said, which is fascinating, which is a much stronger underwriting type role, a much more traditional type of underwriting role, which is people buying with the express purpose that they're gonna be intermediaries, not to tell the general public, but to sort of their collegiate or team or syndicate of other underwriters. I mean, that, that's clearly, if the, if, if the, if the uh, blockchain network hadn't launched yet, and those are securities, they're clearly acting in an underwriter role. Now, they may be okay under some exemption, like the people they're selling to are their own accredited investors or higher level institutions, but there's no denying in that place they're an underwriter. So that, doing, that's, a little, that's a little interesting to me throughout this. Yeah, they were doing that with specific targets if you bought in certain rounds that you'd be eligible to distribute them at a certain, the, at the next round pricing level. That's so a little were, MLM, that's a little multi-level marketing kind of thing. Absolutely was, absolutely was. Did not strike, strike the right chord with me when, when I heard people talking about it and I you know, got introduced to that idea. It's an, it's an interesting dynamic though, because the, if the, if Telegram itself doesn't have the infrastructure to distribute its tokens, but is related to parties that do and have the relationships. You know, underwriting is a valid purpose. It's an efficient way or was an efficient way, maybe before blockchain and everything else, of getting things from the mothership down and distributed through the network of relationships to the end buyers, because not everyone knows everyone. So you kind of need to make use of this. The, um, but when it goes to the initial underwriter at a very discounted price, and that underwriter's profit is not from the market fluctuation of the token, but merely from the markup, that's much more securities-like. And it really does look like a scheme to distribute the tokens eventually to the public, but these people in the middle are not being investors. So it gets tricky. Now, let's take, let's take what you said and put it to one side in one second. The, keep in mind that the way it was described in the preliminary injunction, was these people bought their grand purchase agreements in January, February, and March of 2018. They had to wait really more than a year till October 2019 before Telegram was ready to launch the network. Again, that's a long holding period. It is not congruent with the idea of being an underwriter if you're gonna hold on to whatever it is for so long. That's much, that shows much more sort of a investor intent. Like if I'm buying to immediately resell the public, clearly I'm underwriter. If I wait something under a year, I may or may not be underwriter. They waited more than a year. And it's an interesting little fact that in the Graham purchase agreements, Telegram was obligated to return the investors' money or what was left of it, unless the network launched by October 31st, 2019. So I think Telegram was under a little bit of pressure there, but they renegotiated, interestingly enough, an extension of that time till February 30th, 2020. So coming up now is our deadline for returning the money to the investors. The, so 
these people held on to this for a very long time. And remember, I said that there's there was two rounds of Telegram investors: the the first round and the second round. The first round was larger, and but they had that very long staged up lockup period that would only even start counting once the network launched. Well, if they're holding for a year before the network launches, and then they're holding for maybe another 18 months after launches, it's fantastically hard to argue that they're underwriters. It, 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 the, the securities are coming to rest with them. And they're going to be completely subject to the market fluctuation in the price, not any sort of dealer type commission profit when they turn around and you sell them. I think, I think the court made a horrible argument there. Okay, there's just so much time that passed. Now, what, what screwed it up for Telegram, and they made a mistake when they did this, is the round one investors bought at a very low price, but they had these lockups. Then just a month or two later, they sell to these round two investors for much more money, but without a lockup. Okay. Those round two investors are much closer to being underwriters because the moment the network launched, they would be free to sell their tokens. And the only difference between what they bought and what the round one people bought was the elimination of that lockup period. So th that's a, you know, Pablo, if we're trying to get to how you structure your offering, that's, that's a big no-no. Do not have a short period of time where one investor buys for one price, one purchaser buys for one price, and just a short period of time later, someone else buys for much more. That's a big red flag. And then also don't have your early buyers not have a lockup period. They should have a, a long lockup period. And the specific logic there is if they're holding past the launch of the network and holding past when trading has started, their profit is dependent on the market, not on their kind of commission for distributing the securities. Gordon, what I would suggest is to do some short wrap up because we approach in one hour, but, but I would suggest you to uh, have some meeting minutes so I'm sure because we definitely we touched like 10% of a topic. And I was going to ask you a question about how exactly the security regulation is going to like, should change, but we, it will take another hour to like think about this. So I would rather make a- Actually, I can a, tell you how the law can change in under a minute. minute. Huh? I can tell you how the law should change in under a minute. No, let's do it in a separate volume too. And okay, you will like, shine for an hour, okay? <laughs> because right, hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully I didn't talk everyone's ears off too much. Um, is there any questions in the chat? No, no question. But definitely there would be questions. We just we just covered a small fraction of a topic, honestly. From because yeah. from what I from what I understood from you and Timothy, that was about like a very clever way of structuring all the pieces and somebody not using the clever way and that's how they fail but a very what, good summary yeah <laughs> but obviously i'm a lawyer i don't uh, know what are the details and the message for everyone is if they want to launch some kind of a sale of anything they should talk to lawyers who are clever so that that's the only outcome we can only or, or can. have dan larimer's father yeah yeah, but anyway, I would love to know more about how the securities law shouldn't be changed. So it addresses first opportunities that new technology like provides, mm -hmm. and second threats because it's also like now you can pretend you are decentralized. I mean, we all know that uh, in anonymous environment you can pretend you're fully decentralized. You you cannot prove uh, like the, the it's like with Monero, you cannot prove the fact of a transaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, what should be done? So there are many questions. I can prepare certain questions for the next round, but I would expect from you certain like meeting minutes. So we are not leaving people with, you know, just idea that you should talk to clever lawyers and that's it. Maybe it's a very <laughs> profitable idea, but at the end, yeah. Should we collect emails from people? Well, you know what, I'll write some meeting minutes and maybe you can post under yeah. We'll figure out how to distribute. Yeah. Okay. I think, is that it? Should we stop? Is that good? Yeah. I think it was a good start. I actually enjoyed it. I haven't seen you for, for at least. Glad you did, my friend. Months. And I adore, uh, enjoy this format. I like Timo to join. It feels like, you know, a conference. 
It feels like Bitcoin and potential party COVID edition. Yeah, COVID edition. <laughs> you, you, should, you should do a Bitcoin incredible party, invite some speakers, do some do some slides. It sounds like fun, man. Yeah. Gordon, I, I appreciate your expertise. Thank you for having us. I, I'm, I'm glad you jumped in. That was great. All right, guys. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. For